your neighbors, Branford. Um, yeah. So we've been away for a while. We were in Northern California and uh, we were house pet sitting near one of our sons and his family, taking care of uh, one couple's home and two dogs and then another couple's home and this very old but absolutely gorgeous cat and very affectionate cat. Um, so being taking care of them and being near our family was fabulous. But it's always wonderful to be home and we're delighted to be with you again. Yeah, there were some days though that it would have been nicer to be here <laughs> You're right. in Brantford instead of Northern California because it was cold. Man couple nice couple of days you're so. right one Older day there than here you're exactly right David one day we had um, we were in the 50s in California and you were 70s right here in, wow. in Connecticut so um, <laughs> well anyway we're delighted to be with you again and thank you for tuning in and today we have the distinct privilege to be with an extremely interesting and very talented neighbor of ours in Brantford, how fortunate we are. And her name is Marta Reisman, and welcome Marta. Thank you yes. so much. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Marta, there's so many chapters in your life and so many diverse and interesting ones. I'm just going to begin simply by telling our viewers that you grew in Philadelphia? Yes, I did. And that you've lived in Brantford since 1988. Yes. Um, and uh, as um, we are sitting here, it feels like we are in an art museum. Um, we are uh, surrounded by art um, that you have created and it's very special um, to be here. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So when did your interest in art begin? Oh, it began very long ago when I was in Philadelphia growing up. I was about 10 or 11 and I used to take the subway myself to South Philadelphia wow. to a an art school so I would be able to express myself in art. Wow, at 10 or 11, you knew that you had this yearning and passion to express yourself through the medium of Very art. much so, yes. Wow, that's quite incredible. I don't think that would happen now for a child in any city or that they can take independently, take a train or any form of transportation. Um, you were fortunate. I was. You know, times have changed quite yeah, a bit. Absolutely. They really yeah. have. Yes. So, your intention, though, was really directly on becoming one thing, and that's an English professor. That's correct. <laughs> that's so, correct. So, uh, you started your undergraduate studies, uh, and you studied for two years of uh, Russian language and, uh, and literature. Russian literature. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then you traveled also during uh, your junior year, in, in your undergraduate junior year, to Israel. That's, That's right. That was a big trip. It was a big trip, <laughs> yeah. I'll say. And uh, of course, later on, you then went to, to Columbia University where you um, got your master's in comparative literature. Correct. That's All right. right. So, so there you have a diverse educational background. And how did that assist you when you again went to Israel later on? Well, it certainly... Could you ask that again? Yeah, sure. when, you, when you went back to Israel, now having the Russian uh, education, the language okay. and all of that, how did that assist you? Uh, uh, what, what, what did you do in Israel? Well, it was the unique circumstance. The United States government actually had a company in Israel that translated scientific documents from hmm. Russian to English. And they hired me because I had some knowledge of the Russian language to be, uh, to translate it. Hmm. And then what happened was when I translated, I was much too literary rather than scientific. 
So they made me, they almost fired me from my original job, but then I was asked to edit these Russian scientific texts, which I did. And I did that for about a year and a half. Scientific text. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I know. Far cry from your interest. Wow. You're right. You're wow. right. And it, I made, actually, even my editing was too literary and flowery for them. So after about a year and a half, I was asked to leave. Oh, oh. what do you know? <laughs> so, so you lived there for... I lived there for three and a half years. Oh, three and a half yeah. years. Yeah. Wow. When I first got there, I lived with my uncle, oh. Gershon. And what was unique about that was, at that point, he was the mayor of Jerusalem. Wow. Mayor. So I had a chance to meet some of the leaders in Israel at that time, like Moshe Dayan and oh. Golda Meir. Oh, my goodness. And it was an extremely fortunate and special time in my life. Wow. wow. That would be amazing. Yeah. 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 And, and I understand he was also the founder of the Jerusalem Post. That's exactly right. He founded the English the English Jerusalem Post, which still occurs today. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. He was some, some guy. How yeah. old was he when you were living there? How old was he? He was in his mid-60s. At that time. Yeah, and he died actually when I was there. Oh. And uh, it was very shocking and very sad to the whole Jerusalem community and to wow. our family. Yeah. yeah. He had great impact. He really did. Good point. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, when you were in Israel at that time, were you married? No, when I first went to Israel, I went for my junior year abroad and I was single. Mm -hmm. And it was only later that I met my husband and married him. Wow. Okay. okay. In, in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem? Oh, no, I no. came back to the state to actually marry him. Oh, you met him in Jerusalem, but then you... I actually that. knew him in Philadelphia. <laughs> okay. okay. But we don't have to get into all this. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> and did you raise a family then? Yes. Uh -huh. We had three daughters. And unfortunately, I at this point only have two. Oh, what? Yeah. My, what? my very youngest one passed away. Oh. Yeah. I'm she, so sorry. she was in afflicted with a disease called tuberous sclerosis. What is that? Where she had some growth of cells on her brain that prevented her from developing normally and at the right pace. Mm -hmm. And she never learned how to speak, so she was mute. Oh so it was very hard to know what she wanted. Uh, and I worked with her for 15 minutes out of every half hour of the day for about two years, mm. and she still didn't get better. What was it in patterning? You mean? Yes. Yeah, because David and I patterned a young boy in Brooklyn, a young child around eight, uh, who had been hit by a car. Oh, and wow. we'd go in, and they had all these. Vol did you have lots of volunteers? Yes, I did. They were and neighbors. That's yeah. Okay, so that's what we did, oh. and we patterned. Uh, we take a leg or an arm exactly. and, and we do yeah. yeah. It would simulate like walking. Exactly. And yeah. like exactly. Oh, yeah. and it didn't help. It me didn't either. help, and it included some very unusual exercises where we hung her upside down. Wow. In order to bring more blood flow, breath to the brain oh, or yeah. oxygen oh, to oxygen. the brain. But that program did not work. Oh, yeah. So, but so, you, oh, wow. yeah, I would imagine though, you weren't involved with a career then at that time. It interrupted. It the, interrupted my education and my career, oh. and wow. we did it for about two and a half years. Oh. So, can I ask about your other two daughters? Very much so. Okay. Uh, the daughter, slightly older than her, is a writer, an excellent writer. She published a book about her own experience with a brain tumor, whereupon 10 years later, after she was cured, she ran a triathlon just to celebrate her having been cured. Oh my gosh. Wow. And that really was incredible. She also was a lawyer for a while. Oh, okay. And enjoyed the perks that a lawyer in New York City can have. 
but she did not like working for corporate law and decided to quit. And then she became a journalist and a reporter. Wow. And she's still doing that. You yeah. know, I, I just have to say I so admire any person who has a job that pays well, that offers a lot of prestige, and yet honors their spirit, their soul, their heart, and says, this is not working for me, it's what I want. Yeah, it's not exactly. what I want. Exactly. And I need to express my own authentic self. I honor that. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. And then my older daughter, Anna, is a physician, mm -hmm. but mostly she's a teacher. Oh. And what she teaches, she's a professor at the medical school, and her main interest is medicine and the humanities mm -hmm. because she thinks that doctors will be better doctors if they're exposed mm -hmm. to the humanities. So she does, she runs that every Thursday and it's open to the public. Wow. Mm -hmm. So she, is it, um, is she focusing on the mind-body connection? Very much so. Yes, it's yes. so important and yes. good healing. It is. What it's part wonderful of work. Yes. What wonderful work. I just want to go back um, for a moment, if I may. During this really challenging, <clears throat> excuse me, time, um, did you use your art to um, release and, and sort of vent some of the intensity of your emotions and the challenge that you were facing? Very much so. I did. The problem was I didn't have that much time to create finished products. So I did work somewhat on my art, but did not have the time and kind of deprived myself of that. So it had to be exceedingly difficult mm -hmm. because you weren't a, you didn't, that period of time didn't allow you to express who mm -hmm. you are. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, that had to be very difficult. Yes. So, Marta, yeah. after that, and after the raising of the children and so on, uh, what was your next professional goal? My next professional goal will seem out of thin air. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, not quite magical. Yeah, know, right, right. <laughs> well, then you'll tell us what your inspiration yeah. was to do this. Yeah. <laughs> What happened was, I went at some point in my life to see a therapist to get some help with what I was contending with. Yeah. And she was so effective mm. that I decided that I would like to have that role in society, that oh. I would like to be a therapist Unbelievable. myself. <laughs> and I, I chose that and went through the training and the actual experience of doing that. Oh, was it, was it in any particular area that you worked or preferred to work? It was. I preferred to work with adolescents and their families. Oh. Oh. That was, what was the reason for that? How, how, or well, one when, was personal. I would. I had my own adolescents with whom I was dealing, and that prompted It's a challenge in of itself. Yeah. 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 Knowing the challenge unto itself. Right. Yeah. It really was an interest of mine because I was struck with how much the family influences the outcome of the child's maturity and so on. Yes. Oh, so, uh, I, uh, okay, I recall now you said that you uh, did some uh, counseling of teenagers at, um, was it at Yale? Elmcrest, Elmcrest first okay. for a couple of years, which I enjoyed thoroughly. And then I went to Yale Psychiatric Institute, and the reason for that was because it was close by. Okay, and then also uh, you did more work at the uh, Yale School of Medicine. And you were an instructor, I believe? Oh, right. The, uh, I was honored to be called an instructor, to have that title for about two years while I was working at Yale. Oh. Even though the work was the same, but I had that honor of ah, that title. You know, it's it's quite exceptional to me as I'm listening to your story because there's a lot of us that have gone to therapy. Maybe we really appreciated our therapist, 
but we don't take on the challenge of them going back to school, getting a degree, and becoming that particular right. profession. I really admire how open, I mean, you're open-hearted and open-minded that you, um, you see something, you like it, you, you admire it, and then you become yeah. it. It's quite something. Yeah, and it's jump fun. into it real deep so yeah. that you, yes. you then, as I understand it, when it's a private practice. That's right. That was after I left Yale and decided to actually go into private practice. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy doing that because people who came, I call them the worried well. But I realized, <laughs> worried I, well. the worried well, but I realized that even for that worried well population, there were many aches and pains that needed to be addressed. addressed. For instance, the loss or the breakup of a relationship or the loss of a relative through death, that kind of thing. Um, yes. And how long did you practice? I did that for three years and enjoyed it a lot. And then it was time to retire so I could do more art. <gasps> Is that, so you retired from private practice exactly. to do your art? Yeah, I really needed more time for that. Like mother, like daughter, finding exactly what you want to do and honoring it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Really sure. special. Um, so I, David and I were both privy, um, this is quite a while back, we heard you uh, in a group setting read um, a poem of yours, uh, it was called um, Prima, I think Prima Ballerina. Is That's that right. right. And we were very taken with it, as was this entire group of folks that were attending. And so and we asked that you perhaps we want to do it again. Yeah, so. but before you do that, um, I was wondering, uh, so art, the visual arts, is a passion. Was writing always a passion of yours in a sense? It was, a little less so than the visual art. But I enjoyed, even from a young age, writing light verse about my parents, mm -hmm. my sibling, and as I became part of a workforce, I would also write poems about the people I worked with. Oh, how neat. So I enjoyed doing that. It was fun. It was all very light, but I liked doing that. Beautiful. Well, would you do us the honor of reading um, one of your poems? And if it's okay and you have it close by I <laughs> to, do, uh, yeah. to read Prima Ballerina? I'll be glad to. Thank you so okay. much. Can I do it sitting down? Oh, please. Okay. <laughs> Unless you want to act it out and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll... I better sit okay. down. Okay. okay. Here it goes. <laughs> now, do I look at you and... Oh, I read it's it, fine. But... Just read it, huh? Yeah. The calendar. It's okay. all right. Yeah. Okay. Prima Valerina. Just enjoy. Just enjoy it. 123rd Street perspired dust and noise. Tenements blocked breezes from listless girls and boys. Children slouched along the stoops, but Prima, Pablo's sister, practiced pirouetting to her singing transistor. Mm -hmm. Prima danced before Mama without any flaw. She performed for Brother Paco to his rousing applause. She demonstrated practice steps in her worn pink dancing shoe to her teachers and stunned classmates at PS 82. <laughs> the principal bravoed at Prima's poised perfection and sent her to Madame Lola <laughs> for formal dance direction. Madame Lola in Leotard announced that it was vital that Prima now prepare herself for the citywide recital. Recital. <laughs> but for a month of days and sleepless nights, she rehearsed and she rehearsed. And at the city competition, Prima came in first. First on the Eastern Seaboard, then first in all the nation, acquiring the glow and pomp of an international sensation. Prima danced before the Secretary General of the United Nations. From dictators, dukes, and dowagers, she accepted loud ovations. But 
once she spied a critic who made it very plain that he regarded Prima's dancing with disapproval and disdain. When the audience arose to hail Prima for her feet, the critics sneered and stayed adhered to his 21st row seat. From then on, whenever Prima danced, the grim, lean man was there. And so she lost her confidence, her spirit, and her flair. When before the kings of Europe she was invited to audition, she sighed and pined and then declined and spurned all recognition. Desperate, Madame Lola summoned a distinguished pediatrician to diagnose the cause of Prima's flaws and the loss of her brilliant ambition. Prima rose to speak her mind, I'll seek one cure, there is no other. I'll go back to El Barrio, to Pablo and my mother. 123rd Street still perspired, dust and noise. Struck, trucks still sprayed the street for the wilted girls and boys. Prima charged the broken stairs to the beat of Pablo's transistor. Pablo, Ma, I'm home, I'm home. It's your ballerina sister. And then the dancer told them how, with trembling and with fear, she danced before the critic who reacted with a sneer. Pablo flushed with anger. His fists were clenched in rage. Prima ballerina, go back to the ballet stage. It matters not if others voice approval or rejection. You must practice till you reach your standard of perfection. Yeah. Prima listened carefully and attentively on her sister, and suddenly, with thumping heart, turned on her transistor. She danced to new successes, heeding Pablo's admonition perfecting every pirouette, refining each position. And when the critic reappeared, glowering in his chair, Prima performed a tour de force, never dared anywhere. Bravo, Prima, encore Prima, the most difficult of feats. Pablo, Ma, Madame Lola rose cheering from their seats. Madame Prima Ballerina now teaches girls and boys on 123rd Street to make rhythms out of noise. Wow! <laughs> Fantastic! Thank, Thank you. you. Fantastic. You know, mm. it, it's so, first of all, are you a dancer? No, I'm not at all a dancer, in fact. I was made to leave my dancing class because I was so bad. <laughs> well, you can't be great at everything. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's such a combination, a reflection of who you are. Because to me, it has one of the most important messages. And I think, um, you tell me as a psychotherapist if I'm correct, but I think... Um, it's something that many of us uh, struggle with. We can really have faith in whatever that particular skill or who, we can have faith in it. We could think that we're really fine um, and we thrive oh. off of uh, a lot of encouragement and support. And then in comes the critic. It may be one voice out of so many and that's the voice we listen to. Exactly. And then it robs us of our, I mean, all of a sudden our self-esteem, our feelings of self-worth wither. It's true. It, they do wither. That's a perfect word for it. it. But it's so astonishing to me and so curious because I think it's not, I mean, I struggled with that. But as I grow and grow and have the privilege of growing more, you know, I'm working on it because that negativity does not define us. No, no. And yet it's powerful. But it's so powerful. Yes. 
-hmm. So the message is so awesome. I'm glad. And yet you also put in your great honoring and respect um, and immersion in the arts. So it's such a beautiful combination. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah. so, yeah. so much. Um, Mona, um, you have dancing, you know, the, whole, the focus of this poem is with the dancer, yes. the ballerina, but I don't know if people, the viewers, were able to see, because we did a very brief panoramic view. Um, but there's so many dancing images and figures in your work. Um, is it the joy, you, is that the projection of the joy and feelings of hope that you sort of put out there in the world? Or? It certainly is, and I think of dance as an, the movement itself as an expression of joy. Mm -hmm. Also of connecting to other dancers. I used to love to dance the horror and do folk mm -hmm. dancing. I love it too. So I could connect with other people and enjoy the music and the beat. So the dancing also was part of what I enjoyed doing. Yeah, and through, you know, no matter how privileged or no matter how fascinating um, many of our lives are in various chapters, throughout the challenges that you had, um, which uh, art form, I know you weren't able to create, uh, have the time to create your art, but when you were home and working on, on helping your, you know, Debbie, your, yeah. your Debbie um, what did you bring into your world that helped you at that moment? At that moment, I would say my two other children, because mm -hmm. they were fascinating to watch and engage in as they grew up. Uh, also, some art, but I felt deprived of the time of doing that. Yeah, and but there was music also that entered your world. Yeah, music. I started to like music that was actually from years before the year I was, the years I was enjoying it. But I began to like all different kinds of music that were positive and joy-bringing, despite negative uh, mm. effects, such as James Taylor's mm. Handyman, <laughs> Cat Stevens' Morning Has Broken. Oh, Morning Has yes. Broken. Morning Has Broken yeah. is, is so the epitome of a new beginning, right? Exactly. A new day. A new day. A new day. And there's a song called Moving Toward the Morning as we mm. go through dark periods, the morning shines, promising light in our lives. Light, that's yeah. right. The light at the end of that dark tunnel. Exactly. Right? I think that's such an important part of your life that you can uh, lend to others is that, you know, when we are going through hard times, perhaps we don't all have your talents. And maybe to have extreme talent isn't the important part. Maybe it's the process of, of allowing ourselves to experiment and find joy in it, whether we're fantastic or not. Absolutely. Um, and, and if maybe that's not where we want to go, maybe the ability for us to say, well, there are other, there are so many art forms and there are so many options out there that we can bring into our world to help us heal and to help us deal with what we're going through. Exactly. Yeah, you're so, I mean, you are such a perfect example for that. Uh, it's really inspiring. Um, so can you tell, um, well, let me see. I wanted to um, say that I know that uh, you love trying different eclectic methods in your art and that you began years ago, I don't know if it was, <clears throat> excuse me, in your 20s or 30s, I don't know, that you started doodling with right. pen and ink. Right, I uh, did. And, and, and that you hung them, you told us a story that you hung <laughs> these images on the walls in your living room, and it led to something incredible. Can you share that with oh, our I'd viewers? Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. I'd love to. At one point, the son of the chief of the Dinka tribe of the southern Sudan came to my house, saw my various so-called doodles on the wall, and there's an example of one of them. 
Right here. I don't know yeah. if we can get it zoomed in. That okay. Would be wonderful. I might take a look later. Yeah, That's and, and he studied them. He, there were about four on the walls. He studied them, and he looked at me very seriously and asked me if I were part Dinka of the South Sudan. <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. And that was delightful, and it was encouraging, and it taught me that many art forms have kind of a primitive sameness to many people in different parts of the world. At the same time, he thrilled me by asking me to illustrate a book of folk tales that he was collecting of the Dinka tribe. Every evening, the members of the tribe would take out their living room furniture, bring them outside, sit on sofas, and tell folk tales. The yeah. person who usually told them was the chief. But he was usually very old, and sometimes he fell asleep. Uh -huh. So other members of the tribe would continue his stories. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but how did this particular um, tribesman come in? How did you connect with him? Uh, he was a student of my former husband who taught in the Yale Law School. Oh. So he came in to just be, be a guest in our house. Oh my gosh, what good fortune. It was good fortune. And um, yeah. So actually what you have here can we share is the can product zoom? of his, his folk tales that he was gathering and your artwork which right. adorns the cover. Right. And and there are four there are four pages of illustrations where I use the repeated graph. I don't know how well we can get that for Now maybe viewers. we shouldn't even do it. That's okay. hold it up. Yeah, sure. There's if we can get it. If not, Marta, that's fine. Okay. And did you, do you need the cover? That's fine. You got, you got it. it. Yeah. Thank you. Great. That's yeah. excellent. You know, I looked through this book and I was astonished because, I mean, not really knowing art well, but looking at it, I'd say, oh my God, this African is definitely yeah. an African artist. Yeah. Isn't that something? It's just something to me. Yeah. yeah, and the images viewers in this book are extraordinary. The name of the book is Dinka Folk Tales. If any of you ever want to get it out, it's in our library. It's on Amazon. It's on I mean, Amazon. I don't think it's in our library. Oh, it's in my library. It's in your library. Okay. Right. African <laughs> Stories from the Sudan. The images are absolutely awesome, um, but it, to me it speaks to the oneness of us all. How you could not, have, but who knows what our backgrounds are, and, and if you traced your roots way back, who, who knows? knows? Sure. Yeah. But how this came <laughs> forth is astonishing. Yeah, that was a good story. Yeah, it's really fabulous. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Um, I think, um, yeah, you've done illustrations in acrylic that we see yeah. on your walls, but also you told us painted paper collage. Can we what go is, in the next room? Yeah, we sure can. So before we conclude our time with you, Mortar, um, and I hate to conclude it because this has been extraordinary. Um, can we now take a closer look at just some of the works that you have done? I'd be glad to do that. Great. I guess you can see here that this is in the style of the book of folk tales and of the doodles. And I used a repeatograph on this. What's it? A, what a, a very precise pen. Oh. And it's a very difficult pen to use because it often gets stuck because it's such a fine nib. There's sometimes coagulation in the ink in doesn't itself, flow, and mean? it doesn't flow, ah. and that is extremely frustrating. Mm -hmm. But here I continued the same style of leaving very intricate negative space yes. that would peek, peek through the mm -hmm. drawing. And this actually is the same as one of the illustrations in the book, mm -hmm. repeated a few times with 
the spearing of whatever is in the water by these Dinka people who somehow, wherever they stood, they established a pattern. And I captured that in, in the art. But then I became <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> then I became interested in using more color. So this is an example of my beginning to use other repeatograph pens with varied colors. Not that many, I just used gold and the blue, and of course the repeatograph black. But I was still honing in on the negative space, but not quite as much. But you mean that's ink also? Or that the black is the ink? The and black is pen and ink. And what's the blue? The blue is also a, from a repeat. Oh, I think actually maybe this might have been a Sharpie. Oh. It's hard for me to tell at this point, but I had to fill large. No, this is also a repeatograph. I had to fill large spaces with various shapes. And if you look from afar, they look more solid than they actually are. Mm -hmm. Then I decided I wanted to be much looser. And the negative space here, you could see, is wider. And I was freer. I used the colors. I maintained some of the repeatograph art but I was much more abstract in how I conveyed it. Yes. After that, I was lucky enough to take a course in printing without a press. Oh. And that required making stencils. And the beauty of stencils is that you can have one figure, draw the ink along it, and then you have, because of the stencil, the same figures who could represent other dancers or other figures in this. And this is called Three Women Dancing. And you could see some of the primitive animals or whatever they are yes. in the picture. <laughs> yeah. Um, then I got tired of the dancers <laughs> and I decided dancers alone will not do it. They need partners. <laughs> and they have to show various stages of the rehearsal. And the uh, <laughs> picture was the rehearsal. And when I had it framed, I wasn't satisfied with, with it at all. So I just stuck some more stencil figures on top of the glass. Oh, I love it. Yeah. A painted paper collage, which was the next course I took, emphasized finding textures of various colors, not knowing where they would be, but collecting them. And here I used one of them, you could see in the bird that's in the middle of the picture. And that's called Colors of the Sun and Colors of the Moon, something like that from a Yates poem. And then the dancers continued should we go, can, can, we go? can you just tell us about this one? I find that one fascinating. Yeah. Again, I had the same stencil, so I could have the multiple cat figures. This is called the cats meowing to the moon. Huh. And the cats, of course, are from a stencil. And you could see I also used painted paper collage on some of the texture paper. So can you just tell us a little bit what you mean by painted paper collage? What does that exactly mean? Well, the painted paper is made with en without any sense of what the design will be. So what I do is texture various pieces of paper and then have them available so when I want to make a design, I can use it to put on the collage. So I use the painted paper pieces and put them on the collage. So the cats are painted paper pieces? The, well, they're, they're from a stencil. Uh -huh. And I also used painted paper on some of the other figures, like the circles, some of the other parts mm -hmm. of the design, the circles, and some of the parts of the cats. Fascinating. Yeah. I'd love to watch you work sometime. <laughs> I'd be intimidated. Okay, this is called Tarot Dancing. And as you can see, I used the same stencil figures for three dancers. 
And in terms of media, I used something called modeling paste to get this texture, where the paste stays the same, but I ran a comb through it. Oh, and I was able so to show the shimmering heat. Wow. So, I love the shimmer. Yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, just, Mona, I, I can't say enough. Um, no. Thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure. It's been a joy. It's Absolute been a joy, joy. for me. Thank you thank so much. You. And thank, thank, you, thank you all to our viewing audience. We so appreciate you being with us today. Take good care, blessings, and we'll see you again on Meet Your Neighbors. Bye for Bye -bye. now. Bye.